Hello, fellow followers of Christ, and welcome to the show that introduces you to the men and women behind history's greatest works of literature. Come along every week as we explore these renowned authors, the times and genre in which they wrote, why scholars praise their writing, and how we as Catholics should read and understand their works. I'm Joseph Pierce, and this is The Authority. Hello and welcome to this episode of The Authority. I'm Joseph Pierce. Thanks as always for joining me. Um, th this time we're actually going to be looking at a saint. I think this is the second time we've looked at a saint who also happens to be a literary giant. An earlier episode of The Authority was on St. Robert Southall, St. Robert Southwell if you prefer, uh, the Jesuit martyr and great poet and, and the influence on Shakespeare from the 1590s. Now we're moving into the 1800s to the mid 19th century and late 19th century with another great saint who is also a literary giant and that is the the great Saint John Henry Newman. So um, we're going to put him in context. You will know from various episodes of the authority uh, of the importance of the Romantic Revolution and the Rom Romantic Revival that be be began in, in, in English culture, at least, in, in with uh, the, the publication of lyrical ballads by Wordsworth and Coleridge in 1798. And this, this brought forth uh, romanticism in its reaction against the Enlightenment, sought to find uh, alternative ways of, of, of seeing reality to the cold empiricism, materialism, uh, the, the lack of spirituality of the Enlightenment. And so what began to happen in the wake of Romanticism was a rise of neo-medievalism in various manifestations. So the, these, the, 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 the cultural movements in 19th century England that leapfrogged over the whole of the period of the Enlightenment and rediscovered uh, the splendor of the Middle Ages. And the three major movements in, in, in English culture that, that were manifestations of neo-medievalism were um, the Gothic Revival, in uh, mostly in architecture, but in other aspects of art as well. The Gothic Revival, um, so again, the, the, the leapfrog over the whole period of the neoclassicism, which came in with the Enlightenment. And again, the Enlightenment, what, <laughs> see, it's what I call playing leapfrog. The Enlightenment leapfrogged over the whole period of Christendom and rediscovered pre-Christian Roman and Greek antiquity. Thus, we have neoclassicism. Well, in the 19th century, that the Gothic revival leapfrogged over the whole of the neoclassical movement and rediscovered the Gothic architecture of the Middle Ages. The most famous example of Gothic architecture is the Houses of Parliament in London. Um, you might think that's as old as the Tower of London, which is which is a thousand years old, um, but in actual fact, it's only uh, 150 or so years old, or a little bit, little bit more than that, under 200 years old, designed by Augustus Pugin, who was a convert to the Catholic faith. A second manifestation of neo-medievalism was the pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, the pre-Raphaelites. And again, as the name suggests, they leapfrogged over the whole period of post-Renaissance art and even late Renaissance art uh, to a period of what they considered purity in early Renaissance and medieval art, which was pre-Raphael. So before the artist Raphael, the pre-Raphaelites. But the third manifestation of neo-medievalism and the one that's most uh, pertinent to our uh, our discussion here of St. John Henry Newman was the Oxford movement. And the Oxford movement was a movement within the Church of England. Uh, Newman was, was, was an Anglican clergyman. And he led this, this group, uh, which became known as the Oxford movement. Um, and th this group leapfrogged over the whole period of the Enlightenment, but also the whole period of the Reformation. And... Uh, try to rediscover the Catholicism of the English church um, prior to the Reformation. So again, this, this neo-medievalism, and they, they, they claimed that the Anglican church was in continuum. It's a continuation of the medieval Catholic church, and therefore the Anglican church was uh, Catholic. And so this part of the church became, the Anglican church became known as were well, the high church and and also the Anglo-Catholic uh, part of the church, and this was a, uh, 
within the Anglican Church, this caused a divide because you had the low church who were Protestants and the high church who saw themselves as Catholics. Um, this is not at, at the place to get in a long discussion about that, but we just, just say that, that the Oxford movement was, were, were at the forefront, the avant-garde of the Anglo-Catholic high church, and Newman was the leader of this movement in the 1830s in Oxford uh, and early 1840s. And Newman, through his study of history and theology, and particularly the history and theology of the early church, um, came to the conclusion that the Anglican church was not part of the Catholic church, that there was not a continuum. There was not a, a seamless continuity between the, the, the medieval church in England and the Anglican church. And um, having realized that there was in fact a rupture and that the Anglican church was not part of the Catholic church, he followed his conscience uh, and his reason uh, and became a, a Catholic. And he was received into the church in 1845. And, and we really do need to, to, to try to understand the impact that that made on, on Victorian culture, this um, Victorian England. Newman was highly revered as an intellect and as a man of virtue, a man of eloquence, one of the great writers, one of the great preachers, one of the great scholars, and a good man. And he was seen as probably going to go to the highest echelons of the Anglican Church, the sky's the limit, you know, Archbishop of Canterbury or what have you. So when he becomes a Catholic, and we have to understand that the, the, the Catholicism had been illegal in England for 300 years until Catholic emancipation in 1829, so only a few years earlier, that the Catholic hierarchy had not yet been restored in England. Uh, that would not happen for another five years when Newman is received in 1845. We can't really um, overemphasize the shock that Newman's conversion caused within the Anglican establishment and with the, within the British establishment generally, because how could uh, this man who was so highly admired um, become part of a church that had been so despised uh, by at least the, uh, the higher echelons of, of, of British culture for, for, for centuries at this point? So in the wake of Newman's conversion, it became actually quite fashionable for intellectuals and aristocrats um, to, to follow in his footsteps. There, was a, there were a wave of converts to Catholicism in the, wave, in the wake of Newman's conversion in 1845. So all of a sudden we have this uh, intellectual uh, and blue-blooded, if you like, presence of Catholicism this, this, this religion that had been persecuted, persecuted despised for, for, for three centuries. And at the same time, and you have to see this as providential, 1845, the year of numerous conversions, was also the year of the potato famine, the Irish potato famine. And one consequence of that potato famine, of course, and the widespread starvation in Ireland that was the consequence of it, uh, so the, that was the, the Irish diaspora. So the Irish left Ireland in their droves and, and went to various parts of the world. Of course, many came here to the United States. Many went to Australia, uh, but many came to England and they became uh, a, a, the working class. They, they, they built the railways. They, they, they built the, the roads. They, they built the, the canals. Um, so we, and simultaneously, we have the, 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 from the, the Catholics being a, a very small presence in the country of a few tens of thousands. We now have uh, th th these converts in the higher levels of society coupled with the uh, the, the Irish immigrants uh, pro providing a, a large working class Catholic presence. And this was, this was the birth of the Catholic cultural revival. So we can say that, that the conversion of St. John Henry Newman was really the birth of that revival. I, I sometimes speak about the period from the publication of lyrical ballads in 1845, sorry, in, in, in 1798 to Newman's conversion in 1845, that 47 year period as a gestation period uh, for the revival, but the definitive moment of its birth was the conversion of Newman. Um, so uh, now let's move on to Newman's achievement in a literary sense, as this is about authors. Uh, he is certainly a great preacher, and uh, uh, his published sermons uh, are still very highly revered amongst theologians. 
not only for the content of the theology but also for the for for the quality and beauty and splendor of the prose uh the the the, the critic george levine described newman as the greatest prose stylist of the victorian era now considering that the victorian age in literature which was the the title of a book that chesterton wrote the victorian age in literature was a golden age in literature that the fact that that a, a reputable critic can can say that the greatest pro stylist of this golden age was saint john henry newman says something about the quality of newman's prose it's not easy uh it's a, he, he can compose sentences that are a couple of hundred words long uh containing several semicolons etc but they are masterpieces of construction so newman as a, a preacher and as a as a pro stylist um, he also um, he's has a theologian, probably his most important work, um, uh, which makes him one of the foremost theologians of, of, of all ages, is his um, work, uh, Essay on the Development of Christian Doctrine. And the best way I would explain this, because I'm not a theologian and we don't have a lot of time, um, is with uh, using a metaphor that the great J.R.R. Tolkien used. Um, he said that... Uh, when there was a mania uh, in the 1960s for getting back to the so-called purity of the early church, uh, Tolkien said, and we should bear in mind, by the way, uh, as regards Newman's influence on Tolkien, that um, uh, the Tolkien's guardian following the death of his, his father died when he was very young, his mother died when he was uh, uh, 12, that his, that his guardian after that was Fr uh, Father Francis Morgan, who was a member of the Birmingham Oratory, which is the religious community that, that Newman founded and Father Morgan uh, knew Newman. And so there's this direct correlation. But Tolkien said that uh, I can't understand the, uh, the, the mania for looking for the, searching for the purity of the early church because I don't understand why a sapling should be considered superior to the full grown tree. And he said, and even if, the sapling were superior to the foregrown tree. If you chop down the tree looking for the sapling, you don't find the, the you don't find the sapling. You merely kill the tree. So this understanding of the, the of the Catholic Church's uh, understanding of theology and philosophy and history and and of itself ecclesiology um, as something which develops. Uh, through time, so this essay on the development of Christian doctrine that, that it's, it's, it's always the same, in the sense that, that it's always the tree, right? It doesn't become something else, but it it does grow and 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 it, and it branches out through the centuries and has to respond to different uh, climates, uh, revolutionary climates, philosophical climates, political climates. Uh, heretical climates and respond to these uh, these challenges whilst always remaining the same. That's the essence of what Newman teaches uh, in his essay on the development of Christian doctrine. Now Newman as a philosopher um, is probably best known for uh, his uh, work on the grammar of assent, and basically what he what, what he teaches in in that essay is that truth uh, is connected to goodness and beauty, uh, and that these, because they're ultimately triune, converge uh, in something that allows us to assent to their presence. Uh, and that the good is something which we feel not merely through our reason, but through our conscience. And the, again, this is the connection between between virtue and the ability to perceive reality. So uh, having a, a healthy conscience will allow us to have our eyes opened rather than closed to the reality that's that's beyond us. So this connection between goodness, conscience, and reason. Um, but also this idea um, of... Uh, circumstantial evidence like a court of law that you, you may not be able to have absolute proof of the truth of something but if there are convergence of factors pointing towards it then you uh this is the this is the grammar of assent this this allows us 
to assent to something's being true and to assert its truthfulness without an absolutely um, empirical way of, of proving it, merely because of the convergence of, of evidence, uh, the circumstantial evidence, if you like, and the convergence of evidence being enough for us to assent to the truth of something. Um, okay, the other if, about uh, Newman, so if you like, the higher brow, the cerebral, aspect of, of of his reputation is as a theologian and as a philosopher but he's also a great apologist an apologist of course is one who uh defends the faith um in, in the culture uh, and most most notably is his uh apologia so in the 1860s he wrote an account of his conversion so it's it's quasi autobiographical you know a, 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 a full autobiography is something which tells the whole life story hopefully as objectively and honestly as, as possible that's what an autobiography is one t one tells one's own life story so a conversion story is not strictly speaking autobiography because it's not that's not what newman's doing newman is actually giving the account of the various um things that happened in his life and the various ideas that he uh, had to um, come to terms with in his life, the philosophical and theological uh, forces that, that he had to grapple with in order to, to uh, come to conclusions, which ultimately led to the conclusion that the Catholic Church was the true church and his conversion. So his Apologia Pro Vita Sua, written in, nine, in the 1860s, uh, the, the Apology or Defense for His Life, um, was written because of some uh, scandalous attacks against against him in the media, and he wanted he wanted to the, 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 it suggested that his, his his conversion was somehow dishonest, an act of intellectual dishonesty. So Newman wrote this magnum opus, this marvelous apologia, which for me, arguably, of what I, mean, I haven't read every apologia and I haven't read every autobiography ever written, but from those that I have read. Newman's Apologia is the greatest uh, after uh, St. Augustine's Confessions. So here he outlines the, 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 uh, the reason that led to faith uh, and the convergence of faith and reason in, in harmony, the, how the, the two go hand in hand, and that Newman's acceptance and embrace of, of Catholic faith was a consequence of his acceptance of reason. Newman uh, was also a significant novelist. He only wrote two novels, but they're both very good. Uh, one is a novel called Callista, which is a, a novel set in the early church during the times of the persecution. And it's a conversion story. You'll see a motif working on here, right? Um, in the Apologia, the work of nonfiction, conversion story, historical novel, Callista also a conversion story, and then his novel Loss and Game, which was published in 1848, just three years after his conversion, which parallels his apologia, because there is an autobiographical dimension to this. The character, the protagonist of the novel Charles Reading, is a fairly thinly veiled uh, portrayal of the author Newman himself. Uh, but in fictional terms, we see how Charles Reading in Oxford in the 1830s uh, and earlier, um, uh, comes across these various ideas that that, that for, for force him to to reconsider his position as an Anglican and ultimately to his decision to embrace Catholic Christianity. So uh, they, they go hand in hand. If you want a good exercise, you could read, um, I would probably suggest reading the first book first. In other words, the book that was written first, first the novel, uh, it's called Loss and Gain, published in 1848. Uh, and then afterwards read the non-fictional account, the Apologia Pro Vita Sua, as written about uh, in the 1860s, I forgot the exact date offhand. Um, but I want to actually move on uh, now to Newman as a poet, um, because I love N N Newman as a poet. See, this man is a man of so many gifts and talents, right? Preacher, theologian, philosopher, novelist um and poet 
probably his his greatest work of poetry and certainly the most ambitious is a long poem called The Dream of Gerontius or The Dream of Gerontius. I've heard it pronounced both ways and I think I'm not a classicist, but I think both pronunciations are legitimate. And The Dream of Gerontius is um, an account of the death of a soul and the soul's journey uh, guided uh, and helped by his guardian angel from uh, his death to uh, to to the, the cleansing, purging fires of purgatory. So we have um, similarities here with, with great, great works of literature such as uh, the Divine Comedy, this vision of the afterlife. In fact, if you want to go back to pagan antiquity, we see the vision of the after, afterlife in Homer and, and, and Virgil as well. But um, uh, obviously, Newman's Dream of Gerontius has much more in common with uh, Dante than with those earlier works. He also, some of his poetry, um, so, um, uh, so some of the poetry from Dream of Gerontius is actually turned into hymns, um, and some of his early poetry also uh, were turned into hymns. So we might know uh, at famous hymns, Lead Kindly Light uh, and Praise to the Holiest in the Height, which is actually from the Dream of Gerontius. Uh, these two wonderful hymns. Uh, you'd be pleased to know uh, that I'm not going to sing them. You'd be very pleased to know that I'm not going to sing them if you knew how badly I sung. But what I thought I would do with a little bit of time we have left, uh, I'll, 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 we'll also have a, a few concluding comments, but I want to give a few examples of some of Newman's shorter poetry. The Dream of Gerontius is, say, is, might be considered his magnum opus in terms, in terms of ambition, length. It was uh, turned into uh, an oratorio by the great English classical composer, Sir Edward Elgar. Um, he was commissioned actually to write it on New Year's Day, 1900. And that was nine years after Newman's death. But anyway, that's on the side. But I want to look at some of his sh uh, shorter poems, they're easy to read here so you get a feel. One thing about Newman, he was always a, a, a teacher and a priest and an apologist. So uh, some of his poetry is actually controversial in the best sense of the word. It's dealing with with uh, theological controversy, those, those aspects of Catholic belief that are that, that distinguish Catholics from, say, for instance, Anglicans um, or other uh, non-Catholic Christians. Uh, and, and he sort of uh, teaches, if you like, about the importance of these within the context of very, very good poems. So there's a poem called The Sign of the Cross I would like to to read perhaps uh, and also a poem called um, Guardian Angel but that's not necessarily controversial but The Golden Prison is a poem about uh, purgatory and then there's a, another poem called For the Dead a hymn which is obviously a, a, a defense again of purgatory that the fact that the praying for the dead um, and my favorite of Newman's poems is probably a poem called The Pilgrim Queen uh, which is a history of England um, in, this, in the space of a very short poem, uh, which I love, uh, and it's got a sort of almost a medieval feel about it. We talked about um, uh, neo-medievalism as one of the facets of 19th century culture that led to the Catholic revival. So I think I might end with that before a few final comments about Newman, but I, let me see what I have time to read here. Let me begin with The Sign of the Cross. The Sign of the Cross by St. John Henry Newman. Whene'er across this sinful flesh of mine, I draw the holy sign. All good thoughts stir within me and renew their slumbering strength divine, till there springs up a courage high and true to suffer and to do. And who shall say but hateful spirits around for their brief hour unbound? shudder to see and wail their overthrow, while on far heathen ground some lonely saint hails the fresh odour, though its source he cannot know. This idea of the sign of the cross being a prayer, a wordless prayer, if you like, that's so powerful, it doesn't just um, uh, strengthen us, strengthen the person who makes that prayer, but somehow or other in the economy of grace, in, 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 in God's miraculous salvific way of, 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 uh, of reaching us, that that power of that prayer might help um, some lonely, 
holy soul somewhere else that, 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 that this 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 strength this spiritual strength that comes through the prayer overflows mystically to others to our neighbors uh and i think we'll i'm gonna ha read the golden prison as well because i like that and then we'll read the pilgrim queen then we'll have our concluding comments so the golden prison by um saint john henry newman Weep not for me when I am gone, nor spend thy faithful breath in grieving o'er the spot or hour of all enshrouding death. Nor waste in idle praise thy love on deeds of head or hand which lived within the living book or else are writ in sand. But let it be thy best of prayers that I may find the grace to reach the holy house of toll, the frontier penance place. To reach that golden palace bright where souls elect abide, waiting their sort certain call to heaven with angels at their side. Where hate nor pride nor fear torments the transitory guest, but in the willing agony he plunges and is blessed. And as the fainting patriarch gained his needful halt midway, and then refreshed pursued his path where up the mount it lay. So pray that rescued from the storm of heaven's eternal ire, I may lie down, then rise again, safe and yet saved by fire. He's a great poet. And again, my favorite poet is a subtitle of the song, The Pilgrim Queen. Um, and it's a, basically a history of England ending with a prophecy. And it's a dialogue between the poet and the Blessed Virgin Mary, who is the Pilgrim Queen. The Pilgrim Queen, a song by St. John Henry Newman. There sat a lady all on the ground rays of the morning circled her round save thee and hail to thee gracious and fair in the chill twilight what wouldst thou there here i sit desolate sweetly said she though i am a queen and my name is marie robbers have rifled my garden and store foes they have stolen my air from my bower they said they could keep him far better than I, in a palace all his, planted deep and raised high. T'was a palace of ice, hard and cold as were they, and when summer came, it all melted away. Next would they bar to him, him the supreme, for the spice of the desert and the gold of the stream, and me they bid wander in weeds and alone in this green merry land which once was my own i looked on that lady and out from her eyes came the deep glowing blue of italy's skies and she raised up her head and she smiled as a queen on the day of her crowning so bland and serene a moment she said and the dead shall revive, the giants are failing, the saints are alive. I am coming to rescue my home and my reign, and Peter and Philip are close in my train. It's a marvelous poem, sort of speaks for itself, but um, you might not, well, you might wonder why at the end of the poem there he refers to two particular saints, uh, Saint Peter and Saint Philip. Uh, St. Peter, of course, is St. Peter, the first apostle, uh, the first pope, uh, and this uh, epitomizes, of course, uh, or symbolizes uh, the Catholic Church. But Philip's not actually St. Philip the Apostle, uh, the apostle but St. Philip Neri. So uh, Newman was very, um, uh, very much a, a, a devoted to the Oratory mo Movement, which was founded by St. Philip Neri in the uh, 1500s, uh, 16th century. Uh, and he brought that Oratory Movement to England, founded the Birmingham Oratory. 
and uh, then subsequently uh, other oratories were founded uh, in England, uh, the, the London Oratory, Brompton Oratory, and now there's an Oxford Oratory. Um, so he's referring there to to the the oratory and spirituality of St. Philip Neri, which he would um, champion in England. Okay, so to, to wrap up our discussion of uh, St. John Henry Newman. One thing I haven't mentioned, um, and I'm only going to mention now in passing as part of his legacy, is what the, the role he played in in revitalizing a Catholic liberal arts education. Uh, he wrote a wonderful book um, called the idea uh, of uh, a, a, the idea of a university, and he where he sets out the principles, uh, the philosophy behind a good, solid liberal arts Catholic liberal arts education. And his legacy is made manifest not only in the rise of liberal arts institutions, but uh, the Catholic student centers on campuses and secular and other universities throughout the United States are called Newman Centers in his honor because of the role he played in the restoration and revival of Catholic education. And there's the Cardinal Newman Society, which works for the uh, the revival of, of good, solid Catholic education. And they produce the Newman Guide to Catholic Colleges, allowing parents and prospective students to take a look at which colleges and universities out there are still being faithful to the, to the authentic Catholic education as outlined and taught by Newman. So... Um, it's true that all of us and all of history that we are only see as far as we are able because we stand on the shoulders of giants. Um, we also we know as Catholics that we see further and we see further more to the point not just into history but into eternity, uh, into that those things with heavenly by standing on the shoulders not merely of giants but of those giants who are saints. We stand on the shoulders of saints. Um, in that case, we should we should be very very pleased. Uh, to stand on the shoulders of a literary giant who's also a saint, St. John Henry Newman. St. John Henry Newman, pray for us. Thanks so much for joining me in this episode of The Authority. Please do join me next time. Until then, goodbye, God bless, and good reading. This has been an episode of The Authority with Joseph Pierce, brought to you by TAN. For updates on new episodes and to support The Authority and other great free content, visit theauthoritypodcast.com to subscribe and use coupon code AUTHORITY25 to get 25% off your next order, including books, audiobooks, and video courses by Joseph Pierce on literary giants such as Tolkien, Chesterton, Lewis, Shakespeare, and Belloc, as well as Tan's extensive catalog of content from the saints and great spiritual masters, to strengthen your faith and interior life. To follow Joseph and support his work, check out his blog and sign up for email updates and exclusive content at jpierce.co. And thanks for listening.